The Alpha Sessions with Emma Joyce. Well, I'm joined by Bob James. Hello. <laughs> Welcome to Alpha Sessions and thank you so much for giving us your time because I know you're a really busy man. Well, actually, do you know what? It's uh, it's just nice to do these things um, with actually someone to talk to, you know, because obviously a lot of the a lot of the lockdown stuff is uh, as busy as it is. It's, uh, you know, it's very much solo stuff on your own in a in a dark room so i mean where, where are you at the minute you're in your bedroom? I'm at home yeah i'm at home um you're in a studio you put the most amazing drum kit behind you or two drum kits behind you yeah, three so there's, even there's, <laughs> there's two so like one's like um like a really vintage like premier drum kit from 1969 i think so uh, and, and the one in the sort of further away is um it's more of an 80s sort of uh, more up-to-date kit I guess I mean 80s is still kind of vintage but yeah, uh, yeah. I just I leave, I leave them both set up so um obviously if I want to record either kind of sound I can um or if I'm teaching obviously it's just easier to be have two drum kits set up let's talk about your musical journey how did that start right um well we're going <laughs> right back so I actually started doing musical things uh when I was six years old so wow. uh, I joined a, a local marching band because uh, my older brother did basically, and I, you know, normally followed whatever he did, um, and yeah, wasn't really expecting to to enjoy it or you know for it to turn into what it did. But uh, basically, I went in um, to start playing trumpet, hated it, um, and then I learned to play drums basically uh, from a really young age, um, and then by just fast forwarding quite a few years now, by by the time I was, I don't know, about eleven or twelve, I was actually sort of teaching and writing a lot of the stuff for wow. the rest of them you know obviously because people come and go with these sorts of things um so i ended up, ended up kind of taking it over from a really young age so i got into the the, the writing and the the arrangement kind of, of side of music like really young and obviously when you're a kid you just absorb everything and i loved it and uh so that was kind of like that how the the musical side of me started but with uh singing and just general love for music um I was quite lucky that you know my parents had, and my sister had loads of cool CDs and records and things like that. So I'd just cycle through them and just just take it all in and just sing and stuff at home. And I think by the time I was about nine, I think I got thrust in front of my first karaoke or something like that. And again, <laughs> like because I had all the confidence like, from the marching band stuff, I wasn't afraid to perform in front of people and stuff. So as uh, as young and naff as it would have been, it was just brilliant fun, and I just loved it. So um, and yeah, I guess from about 12 onwards really i started being attracted to more rock and roll and like live band music as opposed to marching stuff and um yeah just start, i just taught i taught myself guitar taught myself bass taught myself just all sitting in my room just like working it out because again the backbone of the marching band was really good because it just gave me an ear for music so i could listen to something and go oh, that's amazing how does that work yeah uh, figure it out on a guitar with like one string left or something you know but just uh yeah, just yeah. just yeah. And plonking around in my bedroom and then that kind of evolved into recording and wanting to now record my own terrible demos you know so i'd get a tape cassette player and rig it up to another radio which would then record it back onto the tape and then things like that so it was always just um no one ever showing me what to do if you know if you like which just made me kind of a bit of a multi-tool you know like so my my thing in the studio is that because I play all these instruments and uh, and and can sing and everything else, um, people don't need a band. You know, if they work with me, I'm the band. So uh, I've never needed anyone's help to record stuff. You know, to just to get things going. A lot, of, I think, a lot of musicians get stuck where they've they need someone else's help to finish a song, or they need this man or that man to to put their package together. Where I've never needed that. Like if I've if I've needed to learn something or needed something done, sorry, I've I've, I've learned how to do it myself. And just be independent so that's kind of where music started and obviously there's been various projects from over the years but i've been fortunate enough to start young enough uh but having a kind of solid background with everything um to sort of learn all the all the wrong ways to do stuff first so you kind of experimented with it and that was how you learned your skill really yeah i mean i was i was just open to everything like again marching band stuff um you know sometimes they'll be like a pop tune that you might be, but you know, a lot of it will be classical music and, and this, that, and the other, or like traditional music. So it gave me a real like 
dick taste, you know, because I'll be doing that there and then I might go home and listen to like Beach Boys and Queen or like Chaz and Dave or just some really obscure and then put a bit of classical and a bit of this and a bit of that. So it just gave me a real kind of acceptance, if you like, for, for all styles of music, um, which I think you need to have. Like, you know, some people can just instantly dismiss a genre, but I've always said there's like, there's brilliant songs and terrible songs in every genre. You know, you just got to, you got to give everything a chance. You know, if you just turn something off straight away because it's a bloke shouting too loud or something, you know, you, that's fair enough. But you might miss the next song on the CD that was actually, you would have really liked, you know, but yeah. you just kind of, no, I only listen to pop music or Radio 1. Uh, so, do you know what I mean? It's it's just yeah. good to have a, a, a wide taste. And I think that shows in my music, you know, like one track sounds like this and then put the next one on it. It's like, hang on, is that the same guy? Is that the same... Thing. Yeah, so different. So, so, so different. I find that when um, when I stumbled across you on the internet. <coughs> Thank you. I mean, I'd get bored. I'd get bored doing it yeah, in the other way. Imagine. Even if you just, if you absolutely just loved this thing, I'm sure after like album five of doing it, like you'd just be like, yeah, a bit done now. So it's good. I, I, whatever I wake up feeling like, that's what I do that day. <laughs> interesting. So have you ever had a thing where you've recorded a song one day and then you've recorded the same song on a different day and they have sounded different. I've got loads of unfinished things. So like uh, 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 what's happened quite a few times over the years where like you start an idea. Yeah. Obviously yeah. you record a, a bit of it or, you know, and you, you know, you hit the wall or you, you get too tired or it's, you just can't think of where it goes next or you weren't happy with it. You know, it could be a number of reasons why it didn't get finished and you've just moved on to the next thing and it's been forgotten. But sometimes you go back through your old libraries and click on a thing and you go, oh, wow, like, that's I forgot how cool that was or what and then you've you've got fresh ears you know and you take it somewhere new so it's pretty rare that I've recorded the same thing twice I've done obviously uh I maybe have done like other versions of the same song like like an acoustic version or something but um normally the where the, the way it's going is normally the way it's going to go uh just by the nature of it unless you've come back to revisit something years later which I do you know um if, if I've had songwriting uh briefs that I need to have a song for a specific thing, then sometimes I'll go back through old ideas and one that's close to the bone, maybe rejig it to, to fit this one. But yeah, I don't know. There's no real kind of rules about it. Just however it comes out, it comes out. Um, I wanted to ask you about a song that stuck out for me, Don't Know How To Love. Um, talk to us about that. Um, what's it about? All right. So um, it was a song I wrote a, uh, many years ago, actually, but I uh, only released it, uh, I believe, in nine, 2019. I think okay. I did that. Uh, yeah, it was before lockdown and all that. Lockdown was just a mess, wasn't it? Uh, but that's kind of a... a we'll a talk timeline. about that in a minute. <laughs> yeah, it was, it's basically a song called Don't Know How, Don't Know How To Love. And what it means is, is that it, it was a time in my life where I was single for about about five years and not really knowing what to do. Because, like, you uh, beforehand, I was used to being in this, like, long thing. And then now I'm not. Uh, and, you know, after you've had X amount of fun, you start sort of thinking, well, oh, let actually kind of want this now and and mm -hmm. when you try to do it it was it was almost like alien to me again of, of what what to do because like obviously the there's the pros and cons of being in a relationship or not being in one isn't there there's obviously freedom over here and then there's being lonely over here and then being able to not do this anymore or do that anymore you know so it, it was kind of being like being on that fence if you like um and at that very point in my life just not knowing how to do it so it was, it was kind of like the grass is always greener on the other side kind of song. I don't know 
in my head and no feet on my chest and no ribs that won't crack under strain. It's safety precaution from her and distortion that keeps me free from pain. Is it a waste of time? A waste of time? I don't know. Oh, 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 oh. Is it a waste of time looking on the floor to pick up all the pieces of a broken heart? When you don't, when you don't, when you really don't know how to love. Tell me how to live. The Alpha Sessions with Emma Joyce. I've seen you on so many different instruments. What is like standard for you when you write lyrics and you're trying to put a melody or some chords in the background? What do you pick up first? It's different every time. Um, so I could, it, you know, I could be sitting in front of the piano. There's a piano in front of me, you can't see it. Or on guitar, whatever. And just, I'm just mucking about. And then I might hit a, a chord or hit a, a few notes that in, in, a, in a row and just that sort of triggers. Ooh, I know what to sing over that. And then I, I start like going lee, 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 over the top with, with different melodies and whatnot. And, and it's, I'd say the lyrics come last for me most of the time. I'll get like, I'll just start like dee, 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 over the top of whatever I'm playing. And then um, it's normally around that stage where I've, I've loosely got some sort of melodies and chords together you know and i'll just quickly record a load of blah de blah and it'll literally be me going and boop, but the bee, and, uh, like, <laughs> just all noises and, yeah so um so it, it's it's normally just gobbledygook until i actually start writing the lyrics last um it's very rare that i start with a lyric unless it's a particular theme or topic that's coming to my head or sometimes it's a news headline or something like that where i know this is the topic yeah. And then obviously I was making music to fit that. But then again, normally it's actual lyrics that come last. But yeah. again, no no rules on it. It just however it happens, it happens. Let's talk about your latest track, um, the tribute to Keith Flint, obviously lead singer artist from the Prodigy. Um, mm -hmm. We were just saying that we were comm commemorating the anniversary pretty recently. Um, is it fair to say you're a fan of the Prodigy? <laughs> But first and foremost, yeah, mass a massive fan. Uh, like yeah. I'm from the same town. Like you know, if you're from Braintree, you're a Prodigy fan. Uh, but um, Liam and his kind of uh, production skills uh, was a real big influence on me and how I work. And just that the whole rock and rollness and raunch of the the band and just the uh, just how how cool they were and obviously so local as well. Uh, so they were a big influence on a lot of my kind of dance or you know that kind of side of my music but um i was actually sure. lucky enough to to know keith somewhat as well um like i i did some sort of work a few times around his house uh yeah. and he, when, I went, when i went on my stag do like uh through uh our lead singer who, who used to work for him uh for the missing andy's lead singer uh and yeah so we were fortunate enough to meet quite a lot of times like we we had his um his last new year's eve together like we all went out for oh. dinner and stuff like that uh and when, when it was my stag do like we all went out to malaga and he invited us out to go and watch the band there and stuff like that so yeah. there was there was quite a few i mean i don't i didn't know him like inside out you know i just knew him enough to say he's a nice geezer and he knew who yeah. i was and everything else but um yeah so we was really gutted obviously when it happened because uh, you know, having seen him so so close before he, he did what he did, yeah. And 
knowing he had some sort of demons and that, but didn't know quite how bad it was. Um, it was just, uh, I just knew at some point I'd, I'd like to do a, a tribute, you know, not only because I love the music and what it sort of gave me as to my skill set, but also you know, just to hats off to the actual, to the man himself, you know, just for for being such a legend. Um, yeah, and it, it was it was easy to do, if you know what I mean. Like uh, the words just kind of fell out, you know, it was, it was all in my head, ready to put to paper and, you know, to put together into a song. And obviously, I wanted to make it a, a prodigy esque style track, and um, and yeah, also just the video gen- kind of that I was watching feels quite prodigy esque. Even if you didn't associate Keith Flint with the prodigy, and you didn't know that obviously he was in the yeah. band, then you can kind of tell from watching you in that video. It, it, it was it was just something I felt like I wanted to do, like um, just to to pay homage to him. You know, like obviously there's millions of fans all around the world that are posting their pictures and their gig pictures up and saying, you know rest in peace and whatnot. And, uh, you know, the way I felt like I could tribute the guy was obviously doing what I do. And um, I think it's come out come out quite well. You know, obviously there's no, like, particular end game with, with doing it, you know, other than uh, if it puts a smile on some faces, you know, if they're fans of the band, then um, then that, that's the goal. It put a smile on mine to make it, so...
The Alpha Sessions with Emma Joyce. Um, you're also part of a band, like you mentioned briefly, uh, Missing Andy. Um, how did you meet? How long have you get, have you been going for? So, I mean, Missing Andy is um, an evolution of uh, quite a few other bands before that. So okay. I guess the quickest story would be that when <laughs> I was in college, um, that's where I met Steve, the guitar, the original guitarist of, yeah. of what is now Missing Andy. Um, and we always made a deal that um, if one of us sort of made it, if you like, they'd help the other one out. Um, yeah. So straight out of college, so I'm, what am I, like 18, 19 years old, I started auditioning for things that were in the, I mean, this was a, in the days where there were auditions in the paper, you know, like a uh, bass player needed to complete band with label interest, you know, that sort of stuff. And you never know what it's going to be. And some, yeah. some of the things I nearly got in ended up being things like Busted and McFly <laughs> and all sorts of things like that. Yeah. Anyway, but... Um, yeah, that's the, the last five people to be in, uh, busted. So oh, luckily, really? I guess that I didn't. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but um, anyway, so like that, I was I was going to like that, um, not knowing what the band's obviously going to be, uh, and I ended up getting picked up by this management uh, a guy called Chris Hughes, who's Amanda Holden's husband. Okay. Uh, so uh, I'm trying to keep this story really brief, but so I got, I got signed to him, and then I said to this manager, you know, you got to look after this guy. I, got, I know Steve; he's a brilliant guitarist, X, Y, and Z. I got him on board and then this band was kind of put together around us <clears throat> uh, with another couple of lads and uh again long story cut short we nearly got signed here we nearly did this nearly did that and then things didn't happen but yeah so then it was elliot that came in on drums one one year and then um it just there was a few changes and ba band name changes and lineup changes for a few years after that and we learned we were in and out of big studios nearly getting signed again to this and to that and you know after a few years of chopping and changing uh the band and whatnot um in 2008 that's when this band became what's called missing andy and that's when we got alex the singer he was much younger than us by about five or six years um so we had him and obviously all those years before that we'd learned the, the ups and downs of the business we kind of put it straight into missing andy and then uh and then the rest is history so yeah just watch this space there's already a, a new single we've released a few months ago uh called the greatest show on earth which you can find now by missing andy but um yeah there's more stuff in the pipeline can i ask why missing andy oh do you know what it's um <laughs> question we will 100 percent get asked in every interview sorry um no, but no, you're fine. It, uh, we 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 give a different answer every time, obviously, because we, <laughs> we got to make up an answer for you now. So, um, Andy is the name of a squirrel that lives in a tree uh, in my garden, and he hasn't <laughs> been seen, he hasn't been seen since 2008. So we called it Missing Andy. That was not the answer I was expecting. No, but uh, to be fair, the actual answer is actually super boring. Uh, so that's why we never give it. <laughs> um, but. We, Obviously, once we'd once we'd made some traction with the with the band, obviously we can change it. So we're not actually big fans of the name ourselves, but it, it does it does um, make you think, it make you ponder. So I guess that's one good thing about it. What's it like being part of a band in the global pandemic? Has it been major challenging? Well, it, it there is no band in a global pandemic. I mean, yeah, the, the only thing we, we were able to do is just get on with some writing, because yeah. uh, to be fair, most of us write alone anyway. Okay. And then we just email each other ideas. It's it's very rare that we ever met up and stood in a room together and jammed or anything like that because we've all got recording stuff uh, to do that. But um, obviously the main thing is gigs. You know that's the main revenue. That's the main fun uh, is is doing the actual live shows and stuff. So yeah. any touring and stuff we have planned or obviously got stopped. And John, our keyboard player, is quite vulnerable. Like he's got bad asthma and stuff like that. So we couldn't really risk meeting up, <clears throat> even in like the kind of restrictions lift that we had uh, so it's just been a big fat pause to be honest mm -hmm. uh, other than just getting some song ideas ready um for the next move uh we've had to just cancel everything so i guess we're a year behind of where we would have been schedule wise but um the hardest thing i think is just not being able to gig at all because like we're, even yeah. while we're writing we still do gigs just to sort of stay fresh so yeah it's just been, it's been really rotten and, and and for i'm lucky that i have other revenue streams you know like i do acting or presenting and voiceover and recording and studio stuff and uh whereas if music performance was my only revenue then i'd be absolutely stuffed yeah i can imagine like many are um 
You just mentioned that you do loads of other stuff, singing, songwriting for other people, acting, voiceovers, multi-instrumentalist. Um, do you have a favourite? What, what I love doing is b being creative. So, like, all of that is, you know. So, just on the music front, obviously, gigs and performance is, is one huge reason I got into music anyway, just love performing. N not to look at me like as in i just love that energy and that that vibe of people singing your songs back and you know all that kind of rock and roll stuff and just the general fun of being on the road but obviously i love the writing side of music i love getting into emotions and that you know kind of side of music also so that's one thing and then obviously like the studio recording other clients <clears throat> and their music and getting into their heads or whether it's songwriting and writing songs for other people and, you know, just the whole area of that is, I love the creativeness, but also with acting, presenting, doing voiceover work and any of the other kind of creative things I do, like radio, whatever. Um, it's all within the same ballpark, I think, you know, it's it's all under entertainment. And uh, I, I, if, as long as I'm doing that, I'm happy. You've also been nominated for an ISSA Rock Artist of the Month nomination. Yeah, um, <clears throat> so the, I, the IS, yeah, it's very cool. So the, the, the they're basically um, an international songwriting association and they're really good. And obviously they're there to nurture up and coming acts. Um, so they run a lot of schemes that basically help you get exposed to the other writers, I guess, mainly, but uh, to anyone who can find it. Um, so, you know, they've got some, lots of good, really good platforms, you know, to get your music videos on, tv channels and that kind of thing but yeah every year they have a, a, a an annual and a monthly uh category if you like to that you can vote for so it's one of those things you can self <clears throat> submit to but obviously um if i think you know sometimes it's trying to get votes which i'm not the big fan of you know because obviously someone can just have more mates than you but yeah <clears throat> what, what what's nice about the association is that they do have like a a bit of a uh a standard if you like so they won't just put anything through you know there's obviously a little bit of a filter where they try and keep the standard high which which is nice um so yeah so i, I got nominated for best rock song i think it was for for that month but uh, whether i've won I, i'm not dead sure you've also recently worked with dizzy rascal on a new tune in november yes <laughs> um again that was another really annoying thing about the covid because um Obviously, he had a. He, he, I'm on his new album, uh, and that nice. came through one, one of my songwriting uh, sources um, through a publishing company called Osterio. And uh, they needed like Dizzy had already written his rap part of this song, uh, and they needed someone to sort of finish it basically, like build something around it. So that's where I came in, wow. and uh, the whole time I thought that I'd be writing this thing, and it'll just be given to someone else to sing, like someone, yeah. you know, someone like Sam Smith or something. And they liked what I did, and they and they said they wanted to keep it. So I ended up just kind of falling onto the album. And uh, that's cool. <clears throat> what, what was really exciting was um, obviously all through 2020, he was going to have a whole album campaign. So that would have been touring up and down the country, doing yeah. like headlining Glastonbury stuff. Oh, that would have been amazing. And we would anyone anyone on the album would have got to go and do it with him. Yeah. Uh, obviously, COVID struck, so he. <clears throat> He pushed his album back and back and back and then eventually just decided to release it anyway. But um, yeah, so I'm hoping that any of the opportunities we lost in the in the COVID to tour together will come back. But again, big question mark on that one. Speaking of COVID, what tunes would you say have got you through the last year? Um, that's a good question. See, I haven't, I mean, I... I'm a little bit bad when it comes to listening to new music. I oh, do it listen doesn't to... have to be new. It can just be songs that get you through. Well, <laughs> so like at the moment, because I get a lot of songwriting briefs, you know, can you write a song that sounds like blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Obviously, I, I do my research and I listen to those things and I find new stuff that way. But um, the biggest saviour has been able, has been being able to make music. Um because if I had a hobby that wasn't music, and you know, say my hobby was like playing golf or whatever, obviously I'm I'm not allowed to do that. So like being locked away from your pastime, if you like, would yeah. would have done my head in. So I've actually been really fortunate in COVID that 
my very hobby, which also is my skill set, if you like, is going down to my studio and doing this. So if anything, COVID gave me more time to do that. So I haven't been stewing or going insane with, with nothing to do. Yeah. Obviously, I've been going nuts not being able to get in that side of it, but I've absolutely had music to rely on through the whole thing. So to answer your question, just, just making music has been the saviour. You know, there's not a particular band that has got me through the hard times or anything like that. Okay. But just being able to do it has been, I've been fortunate. So I feel sorry for those who couldn't, you know, even if, if it's going to the gym or whatever your thing is, you know, not yeah. being able to do that would do my head in. Alpha Sessions with Emma Joyce. Um, can I ask you about Guitar Hero? Yes. 
because this is amazing because before covid i used to work in events and we used to have a lot of brand activations and we had the massive brand new at the time guitar hero speaker like in our yard so oh. i just stand in there for hours and hours in my work day and it's really weird to think that it was probably your face that i was looking at <laughs> yes so basically um the the, uh, the latest guitar hero is called yeah. guitar hero live yeah and where before the games before were like an animated band on the screen and you just hit the button so this time you're standing on stage with a real band so you're the guitarist you've got the guitar in your hand and as you turn left and right you know you see us next to you so um i was the lead singer of a band called yearbook ghosts a fictional band for the game uh, and we were like the kind of there's different genre bands in the game so we were like the pop punk band so we were doing like all your blink 182s and stuff like that yeah a few years ago now like it was it was a good few weeks of, of shooting there was um a lot of cgi and a lot of motion tracking involved. So the band was real, obviously the crowd are real and, and stuff like all the lighting in the stage is real. But um uh the actual guitarist, if you like, that the the player is so from your perspective, you're the guitarist looking out yeah. of your eyes. So that's like a big robot on a camera, on a huge arm, on a big track that sort of jumps all around the stage. So we had to do a few weeks of choreographing where we had to be to not get hit in the face with a camera, uh, and that kind of stuff. And what they did, uh, that, that they obviously made each gig feel like a festival that was huge. You know, it's actually probably only about 20, uh, 20 rows of people, if you like, at the front. But yeah. they made it, it was a million people after that. Uh, but no, that was really fun. And it was a game that I've always played as, as a young yeah. youngster. And then obviously to be in it was 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 super cool. But they, they, they combed the planet for like musicians that could do the job so there was, i guess there was an element of acting as well because obviously we had to do everything twice you had to do the whole thing once all being happy that it's going perfect yeah and then you had the whole lot like it was going terrible as well like looking at the guitarist going what are you doing <laughs> and all that sort of stuff. amazing so much fun though um yeah no it's, it's cool to be part of like rock history if you like in that in a game you've done some awesome collabs with various big names and we've mentioned a couple of them um is there anyone that you would love to collaborate with that you haven't had the chance yet oh that is a that's a mad question um i mean the answer is yes i'd love to work with many people i mean God, that's that's a really that's a really good question because I, I don't have a, an immediate answer like that i guess if it could be anyone i'd love to have had the opportunity to work with someone like, I don't know, Freddie Mercury or, you know, one of me sort of huge influences like that. Nice. Uh, would, have been, would have been great to do something with someone like The Prodigy, you know, just do a guest yeah, vocal. They, they had a few guests down again, like Liam Gallagher did it and, and whatnot. But I don't know. Um, I guess someone who's quite recent, like Young Blood, I think is quite fun. Yeah. Uh, it's yeah. cool to do something with him. But, I um, that, actually. To be fair, I... I, I that, I, I wouldn't be able to clutch a name right out of the sky. I think um, it'd have to be someone that wants to work with me because, like, as a vocalist and producer, I guess I can sort of do either. So, I, I mean, I don't have the most amazing voice in the world, so I can't see myself being sought after as a vocalist to be on someone else's thing. But it would be nice to be able to do a Rob Jones song featuring someone else. Yeah. But, um, who, who knows? Freddie I mean, Mercury. There you go. Done. Yeah, it worked out that way with Dizzy, so... <laughs> But, um, oh God, I mean, I think if I, if I could bring him back to life, I think Freddie Mercury would be like the, the ultimate goal. But, um, I don't know, I'm, I'm open to, to anyone. So, if you're listening, uh, if you want to collab, <laughs> yeah, you're always doing something. What do you do to rest? Um, don't get too much of that, but no, no, to be. <laughs> Again, like in this industry, yeah. like it's not gonna. Nothing comes to you. You have to go and get it. So, yeah, if I'm, and don't get me wrong, we all watch TV and stuff. But if I'm wasting the days watching telly all the time, or playing computer all the time, or doing that kind of thing, then there there is someone else out there working harder than me to get what I want. Do you know what I mean? So, um, there is no rest. If you've got time to twiddle your thumbs, I mean, obviously, everyone needs a bit of downtime, perhaps, but if you... Oh, well, I'm so driven, and I know what I want all the time. If 
I'm too creative to to be sitting there doing nothing, like kicking back. Like the only time I rest is if I fall asleep, and then I go. <laughs> Obviously, I'll, I'll watch TV with the missus now and again because you've got to yeah. do that stuff. Yeah. But I'm talking about like uh, there, there is no rest. You know, if there's if there's like ten songs in my emails that I could be writing for someone, then someone else right now is doing that while I'm not. Do you know what I mean? So I could miss yeah. that. So I, I will rest when I've got a few million pounds in the bank and a boat, and then I, then I'll put it down. But until then, uh, there is no rest. Um, and one final question, what are you working on at the moment that you can tell us about? So to be fair, there's different things every day because different things have priorities. So yeah. again, yeah. I, I've been doing some songwriting for this company called Osterio. And uh, the way it works is a, what's called a brief will come will come in. Uh, so uh, a brief will go to Osterio and then they'll send it out to, to their writers. Um, so it could be... I don't know, one day it could be Korean boy band needs a song that sounds just like Backstreet Boys and yeah. Miley Cyrus, yeah. and it must be this speed and it must have the word egg in it or whatever, you know? <laughs> uh, That'd be amazing. And then, and then five minutes later, uh, another one will come in. So this dance DJ needs a singer to sing, make something up for this song, or we need a song for the Eurovision Song Contest, or we need this, or we need that. So it... it what you're working on at the moment can can just change in a heartbeat. If people want to find out more about you, um, where can they go? What can they do? Hit us up on your socials. I've made it really easy. So on all socials and all streaming sites and whatnot, it's at Rob Jones TV. Simple. So whether that's Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, Spotify, iTunes, just type Rob Jones TV and you're there. Amazing. Thank you so much for um, giving us your time. Like I said before, I know you're a very busy man. <laughs> All right. My words unspoken. Still